All right. Hello, everyone. How's it going? All right. My timer has already started, um, and I don't base the amount of content in my talk based on how much time I have. I just base uh, this the uh, quickness of my speaking based off of how much time I have. So, uh, my name is Ryan Boyd, uh, RyGuyRG on Twitter, and I'm not used to seeing this quite so large behind me. Um, but uh, give you a little bit of background about myself so you can understand where I'm coming here for this session. Uh, yes, I'm from Neo4j. This session really has nothing to do with Neo4j. Um, it's just my excuse uh, to present this talk. Um, so I've built web applications and APIs uh, in an enterprise environment, uh, actually higher ed, but essentially the same thing. Um, and then I worked at Google for eight years on a lot of different products, 20-some-odd uh, different APIs, but mostly around Google Apps and Cloud Platform. Work with a bunch of technologies. There's my email address. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. So my personal API evolution. Um, I started off uh, my career, this was probably about year 2000, working on SOAP-based APIs for legacy systems, making e-commerce APIs for internal uh, use uh, amongst various systems at the university, uh, both in Java, on uh, Solaris machines, as well as in uh, .NET. And um, very simple APIs, uh, very quick and easy to create. Uh, although based off of the, the WS stack, um, it, you know, the overall stack is quite convoluted, uh, but the portions at which I offered uh, to my users were, was, was a small portion of that stack. Um, and then I wanted to syndicate a lot of content. So uh, at the time, I did RSS feeds. Um, and this was RSS feeds not for blogs, but RSS feeds for data, such as events calendar uh, data. So if you wanted to sub subscribe and understand what all the events were happening in the university or put that into a portal or something like that, uh, that's what we used for syndicating that data. Um, and you know, this was kind of an important part of the evolution, made it a lot lighter weight than the SOAP stack and things like that, uh, but was kind of abusing the, the RSS spec in a way. But then came along the Atom spec, uh, and I went to Google and worked on Atom Publishing Protocol and the Google Data APIs, which were all based off of Atom Publishing Protocol. Uh, Atom being a XML-based specification, uh, and Atom Pub being a very pure REST implementation. Um, and I'll talk about what that means here in a second. Along the way, I've worked on a variety of different auth technologies, wrote a book on OAuth 2, um, and worked on uh, OpenID things, um, and also Google's proprietary client login and auth sub. A lot of different auth technologies that underlie many of these APIs that you have to understand to use many of these APIs or to create APIs. And then, obviously, where we're at today, which is uh, JSON and, you know, as a data format and, uh, from a protocol perspective, uh, a combination a bit of REST and RPC. Uh, I think the current trend is to not be as strict as, as doing a pure REST model uh, as we once were, and I'll talk about a little bit why that was problematic. So I've worked on design of APIs, uh, working with the various product and engineering teams um, across uh, a bunch of the Google applications, Calendar, Google Drive, things like that, um, and trying to really understand what the requirements are from our developers and feed that into the design process. Then, obviously, implementing APIs, as we talked about, testing, writing whole suites of integration tests to make sure that the APIs are up and running and operating as they should. In the pure REST APIs, this meant posting data to the server, getting it back, making sure it is what we expect, uh, then doing a put to the server with an edit, getting it back, making sure it is what we expect, um, and uh, then do, doing uh, delete operations, making sure it was truly deleted, things like that. Documentation we're going to talk about is quite important, and I've written a lot of it. Support and triage, um, debugging things uh, for other people, and then writing libraries so that it hopefully makes it easier for developers to implement your APIs um, and less problematic on the debugging and the support side. Uh, and then, of course, using it. So I'm going to give you 15 lessons um, about API development. Uh, and I, it's good. I have 15 minutes. So I have one minute per lesson here. First of all, want consistency. Well, you won't have it without control. 
Um, so this lesson comes from working on a wide variety of different standards. Um, so we started off working on the Google Data API standard, which is a standard format uh, for how APIs should represent data uh, at Google. And then we tried to actually push it out externally a bit too. Um, and you know what came is that in the end, different services end up offering, offering the features that they want to offer. Right, so the, the APIs for Google Data APIs, um, Google provided a central library that all the different services adopted that library, but were running it on their own servers. Um, and as they were running it on their own servers, when new features came out, they didn't necessarily adopt it. So if you looked at across all the different Google services, different APIs had different sets of features, even though it was supposed to be this underlying standard. Um, and what we ended up doing at Google is moving more towards uh, a thing called Apiary, uh, which basically was a central server environment um, so that all APIs uh, at Google that kind of follow the standard Google APIs now uh, have the same underlying set of protocol and data format features. Um, that's where basically they took over central control of the APIs uh, to make sure that there was consistency. We also had this challenge with uh, Open Social. Uh, if you guys remember Open Social back in the days, uh, before there was, uh, before Facebook was quite as popular as it is, uh, there was a thing called Open Social, uh, which were gadgets that ran inside social networks. Uh, open Social was a standard, but uh, as a standard, um, the people who Basically, the developers decided who they wanted to build against, and they decided who they wanted to build against based off of the size of the audience they could reach. And uh, in the case of Open Social, that was MySpace. They decided to build against MySpace. Thus, MySpace essentially had the control over how the APIs worked, how Open Social worked as a standard, um, because MySpace had the audience. So they made adjustments to their APIs that were not in alignment with the standard, um, and then everyone started building their, their applications not in alignment with the standard. So I don't want to sound like anti-standard entirely. I think that there are certainly benefits, and we've experienced that with the web. Um, but there is a, is a challenge when you're building APIs if you're trying to maintain consistency uh, without control. Just because it is cool doesn't mean it won't kill. Um, kill might be a strong word here. Um, but I want to encourage you all, like, look at the, the latest and greatest technologies. Look at what the fads are, but don't jump into them right away with APIs. Because with APIs, you're going to end up supporting the APIs for a very long time, or hopefully. Um, you'll end up supporting them for a long time because your developers don't want to have to keep on rewriting their code. So you want to be a little bit more conservative than you might be with what technologies you adopt for your UI. Ambition is your greatest tool. So why do developers interact with your API? Um, I've worked on so many different APIs, and I would say it boils down to they interact with APIs because they want money. They're trying to build a business of some sort. They're trying to get into a marketplace uh, or something like that. They want fame. They are trying to, to get the number of downloads of, of their application, or they're trying to get uh, publicity uh, in, in blog posts and in articles uh, and in the press, or they want a sense of accomplishment. Uh, they just want to, to feel that they've done something awesome, uh, and they're taking advantage of your API to do something awesome. And for one of those three reasons, or all three of them, uh, that's why developers build against your APIs. So the more that you can provide in those areas to the community of developers you have building on your APIs, the better off you will be. There's an iterative process here. Listen to developers before you start building your APIs code your APIs based off of what you're hearing from your developers, and 
do it in a trusted tester program. Do it with a small group of developers first. Try to recruit as diverse of a group as possible. Um, but build your APIs based off of actual real life feedback and just keep on iterating them. And you know, we did this all the time at, at Google. We would sign up a bunch of developers before the API is public and we would iterate with them a lot on everything. We'd iterate with them on the actual code of the APIs, on the functionality of the APIs, on the documentation, on the libraries, well before it was actually public. And then listen again. And then scale is probably the most important feedback that I have here, is that you are building your APIs to be used by developers. Developers are going to be using a wide variety of different platforms and tools and technologies to work with your APIs. Uh, at least with HTTP APIs or, or fairly open APIs. They're going to be using everything under the sun. You can't afford to have bad documentation. You can't afford to have bad tools. You need to scale those things because you cannot provide one-to-one -one support to the wide developer community like you provided with those trusted testers. So scaling is extremely important, and then constantly iterating on that scale process. Mean what you say and say what you mean. I have seen so many different APIs that do this. I have an error in my API request, and the API returns HTTP 200 OK. Well, first of all, it's a 200 response for an error. That doesn't make any sense. And secondly, how am I supposed to do this in a machine-readable fashion? Yeah, sure, HTML should be machine-readable. In this case, it's actually well-formed HTML. But come on, um, return the API response from your errors in the same way as you would expect uh, as a developer to receive them. And uh, that means oftentimes nowadays it's a JSON response. Uh, but basically, return your errors the same as everything else. Don't just rely on your underlying web server to throw the right error page. Uh, this is my baby. Uh, she's a, now a year old, but um, from the moment she was born, she told us how, when she was upset. She told us when she was set up upset by screaming. She screamed when she was hungry. She screamed when she needed a diaper change. She screamed when she was tired. She basically just screamed. Now, this is problematic, and in APIs, we actually deal with the same thing. There are oftentimes people write APIs that will return error messages like this. We get a 500 response back, but notice the content length of zero. There's no additional information about what went wrong. We're oblivious to that as we're working with the API. This is also a big problem for debugging, for scaling out the, the level of support you can provide for developers. So uh, my daughter has iterated since then. Uh, my daughter now uh, gives us a very small selection of sign language, uh, and this means that she wants milk. Um, and so this is much more helpful. Uh, and in your APIs, you can do the same thing. You can have an API response that is an error. You still use the appropriate HTTP status code, uh, and you add an error number as well as an error message. And I say the error number uh, simply because you don't want people to rely too much upon these strings uh, that you're using, especially when you're working with developers all around the world, speaking different languages, things like that. Having an error number and a good index of those in your documentation is important. Uh, but most importantly, make sure you return different errors for different uh, error, you know, error codes for different errors. And you also want to make your day easier in, say, 37 days. You don't know what's going to happen 37 days from now. You don't know what you're going to be doing. You don't know if you're going to be sitting at a wedding waiting to see your best friend get married when you have some API issues. And you have API issues that say something like this. Uh, imagine this was posted on a uh, group discussion list, nowadays Slack. I get a 500 error when doing post. It's intermittent. And all I get is a 500 error. A lot of information to go by. So you're like, what the hell? What do I do here? What do I do as an API provider to solve this problem? Or worse yet, 
you might get something that looks like this, which we got all the time too, because people start relying upon your client libraries uh, to interact with your APIs. So they don't even know what the underlying HTTP message, maybe you have a really awesome uh, error message, but a lot of developers won't really inspect the inspection, sorry, ex inspect the exception object. Uh, they will just say, hey, I'm getting this error um, and I need to deal with it. Blogger had a really interesting solution to this. How many of you can read this? Tell me what it says. <laughs> um, this is uh, an example of a Java stack trace, except it's a Java stack trace that is encrypted uh, using a, uh, a public key that Google has. And um, this includes all the information about what happened uh, at the time the error, error occurred. Um, now, sometimes in, in the Blogger APIs, historically, they actually gave you the stack trace. That actually is a, a security problem. But uh, then they migrated more towards this, where they, they actually caught all errors, regardless of whether they didn't catch them anywhere else. And uh, they took the stack trace and they encrypted it. And then a developer could actually write you and say, hey, you know, Google, here's the error message that I got. I've copied and pasted it. The Google personnel uh, could then look up and figure out what the stack trace is and figure out who to notify as a developer. Now, this was important for Google because they're spread it out over tons of different servers all around the world. You had no idea there could be thousands of different API servers, um, and the logs were not aggregated in real time. Nowadays, if you're building an API for a smaller population and you have logs aggregated in real time, you might just be able to give a stack trace error code um, and then have it stored in your database, but then think about what happens if your database fails, what will your users get? But uh, one thing that you might want to do nowadays, I used to tell everyone to use like Wireshark to debug their APIs. Uh, nowadays, you can give Postman recipes uh, so that people know how to, to, to work against your APIs and recreate scenarios even outside of your core libraries. Your developers care, or your users care. Let them. Uh, and what I mean by this is have documentation that has the concept of user contributions to it, or at least a way that the users can provide feedback on your documentation in a lightweight fashion. PHP did this, uh, and for years, uh, this was very, very helpful for me back many years ago when I was actually a PHP developer. Um, and nowadays, there are other ways that this is done. Google has a, a button that says, it worked or I got an error in the documentation. And if you say, I got an error, you get to actually highlight the part of the documentation which you didn't think actually worked um, and send feedback directly to the tech writer's uh, bug queue. Uh, but this is really important. Your documentation will not stay correct as you iterate on your API. I can guarantee it. Even the best tech writers in the world are not going to keep their documentation perfect because none of us are perfect. Let your eyes exist in harmony with your bytes. What I mean here is a lot of times people are building APIs that interact with a service that also has a UI. Um, and so, for instance, we had this uh, service at RIT where I was working at a university many, many years ago. Uh, I had to pull this off of archive.org. But schedule of courses, rather simple on the front end side. Uh, but it hooked into a back-end mainframe and a bunch of APIs to get to that mainframe, and it did screen scraping of the mainframe, all sorts of ugliness in the back-end. But um, we did not offer this as an API. Um, and so what happened as a result of that is people end up scraping it. Um, and the moral of the story is, is that if you do not have an API that f aligns well with the features that are in your UI, people as developers will find a way to do it. Uh, in this case, John Rezig is, one of the, is the guy that figured out how to scrape all of this and offer his own service, uh, and later on went to create jQuery. So maybe this was part of his learning path, and maybe we wouldn't have jQuery uh, if we actually had an API for this. But um, it is important for you to think about whether developers are going to find a way around your lack of API functionality. The best way to do this is build on top of your own API. That's what we do the, at, at uh, Neo. 
the browser team is actually their own separate team that builds on top of APIs that the product offers, and uh, they don't have any additional APIs. Inequality yields instability. So if you have different API features uh, available for different users, you will create a community that is upset with you for some reason or the other. That may be OK. It may be still important to do that. Um, but uh, the next one, and I have zero seconds left, so I'm going to get you through 10 of these rather than 15. Uh, but we will send out the slides, and you will get more. But be flexible, yet prescriptive. So as you build your APIs, um, this is a strict REST model. Uh, what I was talking about with Atom Publishing Protocol, you take your data um, and represent it in this XML. When you want to make an edit to the XML, you get the XML, you make your updates, and then you put the updates back to the server. If you deleted an element in that process, it would be deleted on the server. Um, and what developers will often do is they ignore the get process, and they just do the put, expecting that they know what the uh, format of that put will be. Um, and if you later add some additional elements to your XML, uh, the developers won't know that, and they won't put the things back. So um, Iron needs to be bent occasionally. Basically, don't always follow the strict standards. Sometimes you need to uh, be a little bit more prescriptive for your developers. OK, um, I am out of time. And I will send slides for you folks so that you have uh, the full content. To them. And if you have any questions why the other people get set up, you can feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. And can you repeat your Twitter handle again? Oh, sorry. Um, RyGuyRG, R-Y-G-U-Y-R-G. And if you need any clarification, you can always um, tweet out hashtag DevNetCreate and ask any questions. And there's, we have plenty of staff members to help answer questions. And a reminder, um, as we mentioned earlier, about the bingo cards. Uh, on the back of the card, there's a bunch of different questions and things that you can um, find or do. And if you get them all checked off, you can win a t-shirt. And if you need any help with that, just ask any staff, and they'll help you through it. Um, some of it sounds intimidating or strenuous. It's actually really easy and should all take you know, less than a few minutes.